Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this session of the IAC Summer School. So it's our third state-of-the-art lecture for this module. And it's my great pleasure this afternoon to welcome Dr. Mary Schubert berrigan who is the head of the monographs program at IARC. And she joined IARC in uh, 2018 as a senior epidemiologist first. And with her team, she leads evaluation of the epidemiological and experimental evidence base to identify preventable causes of human cancer. Previously, Mary researched the causes of occupational cancer for 20 years at the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health in the US. And there she led multidisciplinary teams conducting epidemiological studies on the health effects of occupational exposures to beryllium, carbon nanotubes, nuclear work, radon, cosmic radiation, and circadian disruption. Many, Mary has co-authored um, over 125 publications on these topics, and uh, her research, particularly on lung cancer from beryllium exposure in workers, was used in the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in the US in setting a more protective occupational exposure limit in 2017. And today, she will tell us a bit more about occupational and environmental cancer epidemiology. Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura, and it's really an honor to be here at the very first in-person uh, summer school session at our new headquarters. So I'm delighted at the opportunity to speak not only to the students here in the room, but also to those joining us remotely. So today, I am going to be talking with you about occupational and environmental cancer epidemiology. And of course, since I come from the monographs program, I'll be emphasizing how we sort of synthesize and understand um, the broad evidence base. So the first objective for me today is to, to help you recall what are the occupational and environmental carcinogens, and how do we know that they are carcinogens. Then we'll discuss the challenges and controversies related to occupational and environmental epidemiology. I'll also go through um, an approach to calculating the burden of cancer that's attributable to occupational and environmental carcinogens. And it's interesting to know that this burden far exceeds the burden of injury or death from safety violations in workplaces. So the health effects affecting workers globally are, are far in exceedance of, of those that are sort of acute effects to safety. We'll then understand how occupational and environmental studies in epidemiology have been and can be used for risk assessment pur purposes and to also set exposure limits to reduce the cancer burden among workers in particular. And then lastly, we'll close with some, um, I'll point you to some emerging occupational and environmental carcinogens and close with a very brief rundown of what we've seen from the monographs program. So it's a lot to go through in one hour. We're dividing it into two parts. The first part is sort of the background information, why we want to study environmental and occupational carcinogens, as well as talking more about occupational cancer. And then part two will focus on environmental cancer, looking at examples of carcinogens in the environment, calculations of the burden, and then using epidemiologic data in risk assessment, finally closing with those emerging occupational and environmental carcinogens. So part one begins here. And the first question is, why would anyone want to study occupational and environmental cancer? Well, almost everyone is in the workforce at one time or another in their life. And also, everyone, of course, is exposed to the environment. We all breathe the air, drink the water, and eat the food that's around us. Additionally, we study occupational and environmental cancer because the burden of attributable disease can be very large. And so it's an important public health topic. In addition, these are preventable causes of cancer. Um, exposures can be reduced through a variety of interventions. So it's actually quite meaningful to conduct these studies so that we understand where to target these interventions. So you may now be wondering, well, how do we know whether an occupational or environmental exposure can cause cancer? Is it enough to just conduct a single study? You've, you've heard all about study designs. Can I conduct the world's best cohort study or world's best case control study? And then we will know the answer from that study. Well, it's not exactly that simple. And this is where the IARC monographs program comes in. 
and I apologize that this is a bit hard to read, but the monographs is an evidence synthesis and classification systematic review process. It consists of five steps, and those of you who've been trained in systematic review will understand the importance of this systematic approach. Step one is to identify relevant information. Step two is to screen, select, and organize the studies that were found. Step three is to evaluate the quality and potential for bias in the studies. Step four is to carefully report on study characteristics. And step five is to synthesize the evidence and to reach an overall evaluation. And this evidence synthesis and integration happens at each monographs meeting in an eight-day meeting that's held here in Lyon, bringing together experts on the topic from all over the world. The evidence is first synthesized within three different streams. And the first stream is the cancer epidemiology stream. This is cancer in humans. So the overall body of evidence, including your study of this cohort and someone else's case control study and someone over there's uh, cross-sectional study if relevant, all of this evidence is synthesized to reach a conclusion about whether evidence is sufficient, limited, inadequate, or even evidence suggesting lack of carcinogenicity. And this determination is made for each and every cancer type that may be experienced in, this, in the studies. The second stream that's considered is cancer in experimental animals. And here, the same four descriptors are used, but of course, the evidence base is very different. These are experimental studies of animals that have been intentionally exposed to the agent. The third evidence stream is the, the newest, and it's the mechanistic and other relevant data evidence stream. Here, the descriptors are strong evidence, limited evidence, and inadequate evidence. And then the three streams are integrated at the meeting to reach an overall all evaluation into one of four possible categories. The first is group one, which means carcinogenic to humans. There are 126 agents of all kinds, physical, biological, exposure circumstances, um, and chemicals um, that are in this group of 126 agents. In addition, group 2A is a possible category. This is probably carcinogenic to humans, and it's the smallest category with 94 agents. Group 2B is possibly carcinogenic to humans, and this is a rather large group with 328 agents in it. Um, however, the, the largest group of all is group three, which is not classifiable as to its carcinogenicity to humans, and there are 500 agents in this category. Occupational epidemiology has been critical to the identification of the group one agents. Um, of the 126 agents classified as carcinogenic to humans in group one, 60 have been classified based on occupational studies that have shown sufficient evidence of carcinogenicity in humans. These 60 also include some occupations and industries that are considered to cause cancer without us knowing exactly what specific agent is carcinogenic. And two examples include occupational exposure as a painter and occupational exposure as a firefighter. And I will go through the latter category in, in a bit of detail. So just to recap, um, about five years ago, a very nice paper was published by the former senior epidemiologist, Dana Loomis, and colleagues. And it, they looked at all of the group one agents at that point, and then looked at which ones had occupational exposure, which ones had sufficient evidence in humans, and which had occupational epidemiology data. And this is how we arrive at the proportion of the group one agents that are really in group one because of occupational studies. So some takeaway messages, I'm, I'm just listing most of the group one agents or many of the group one agents here that came from the occupational uh, group. The, the group listed here are the physical agents, dusts and fibers, and the metals. And if you look at the column on the right, it shows the cancer sites that have sufficient evidence for these different agents. So one thing that pops right out at you is that the most common cancer sites that have sufficient evidence for this group of agents, the physical agents, the dust, the fibers, and the metals, they're all primarily in the respiratory tract um, and a few in skin. So it's sort of the site of initial contact that is, is important here. By contrast, the group of uh, chemicals and chemical mixtures, for these groups, the most common cancer sites that show sufficient evidence in humans 
are the lung, the liver, the bladder, the skin, and the lymphatic and hematopoietic system. So it's really a difference in terms of how the chemical is processed. Perhaps it requires metabolic activation or something to happen in the body for cancer to be observed. But it's a, it's a fairly long list of, of agents known to cause cancer in the workplace. I mentioned that I would talk a little bit about Monographs Volume 132. This was carried out one year ago. This was occupational exposure as a firefighter. And it had been last evaluated in 2007 with a Group 2B classification. And the Group 2B was based on there being limited evidence for cancer in humans. And this was coming from uh, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So since that 15-year period, there had been many, many new studies conducted. And so we were advised to once again evaluate occupational exposure as a firefighter. So how did they evaluate the human cancer evidence? Well, the three streams, as I mentioned, are, are classified into these predetermined categories. For a, for a sufficient call, the working group concludes that a causal relationship has been established. And what this means is that a positive association is observed in the overall body of evidence and that chance, bias, and confounding can be ruled out with reasonable confidence. Not absolute certainty, but reasonable confidence. For a conclusion of limited evidence, there is a positive association seen in the body of evidence, so a causal interpretation may be credible. However, chance bias and or confounding could not be ruled out with reasonable confidence. For an inadequate determination, the studies permit no conclusion about the presence or absence of a causal association or no data were available. Then the category of evidence suggesting lack of carcinogenicity, it's more rarely achieved, but it is seen when we have high quality studies that cover the full range of exposure, which are consistent in not showing a positive association at any level of exposure. So it is a rather high bar to achieve, but we do have in fact some cancer sites that have ESLC for different agents that have been evaluated in the monographs. And one example is liver cancer with coffee consumption. So there's actually decent evidence that coffee consumption is protective for liver cancer. And so there was an ESLC designation given in the most recent evaluation. It's also true that you can have some sites that have ESLC, evidence suggesting lack of carcinogenicity, for one site, but sufficient evidence for another site. And an example here is, is uh, the drug tamoxifen, which is known to be protective against breast cancer, but it, it causes endometrial cancer. So just this is why it is important to classify each cancer site independently for each agent. In addition, the mechanistic evidence stream is based on knowledge of what behaviors the group one carcinogens exhibit. How do, they, how do they exert their carcinogenic effect? How do they cause cancer? After the volume 100 meeting, which resulted in a review of all of the then known carcinogens, um, a series of workshops were held. And a major output was the identification of what are known as the 10 key characteristics of human carcinogens. So these are listed here on the left, and these are the chemical and biological properties of the established human carcinogens. Data on these key characteristics can be used to provide evidence of carcinogenicity even in the absence of actual human cancer evidence because they are shown to be fairly strongly associated with the development of cancer. So they may be also used to assemble the data for each monograph's evaluation that are relevant to the mechanisms of carcinogenesis without knowing a priori how the process happens for each and every agent. So working groups do not set up what we would call an adverse outcome pathway showing point A, exposure to the agent, and point Z, the development of the cancer. This was a really important um, new principle with the reevaluation of the group one agents. So here they are shown here, the 10 key characteristics. I realize this is a bit hard to read, but one thing to note is that some agents exhibit many key characteristics, while others only exhibit two or maybe one. Um, one example, a well-known example, is ethylene oxide, which is in group one, and it is quite well known to be genotoxic. Oncogenic viruses, which are carcinogenic, often exert their effects through immortalization of cells in the human body, which is what, what causes cancer to develop. 
another example from the environmental field is dioxin, 2378-tetrachlorodibenzoparadioxin, to be precise. Um, this is well known to modulate the AH receptor. So this is the classical um, uh, agent that is known to, to cause this particular KC. So there are many other examples. Benzene is probably the most well-studied carcinogen, and it exhibits at least four of these 10 key characteristics. So back to firefighters, giving you that little bit of background, the working group conducted a meta-analysis of all of the literature that had been conducted, and this meta-analysis proved to be quite influential in their evaluation. They concluded that there was sufficient evidence that occupational exposure as a firefighter causes mesothelioma and bladder cancer, and limited evidence that it causes testicular cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, prostate cancer, melanoma of skin, and colon cancer. For all other cancer sites, the evidence was inadequate. And when the working group evaluated the key characteristics, very interestingly, they found that there had been a large number of mechanistic studies conducted in firefighters, and these identified five key characteristics that had consistent and coherent evidence in exposed humans. And these were evidence of genotoxicity, evidence that epigenetic alterations were induced, evidence for the induction of oxidative stress and of chronic inflammation. And lastly, there was evidence that exposure modulates receptor-mediated effects as well. So quite strong and convincing mechanistic evidence to support the determination of uh, sufficient evidence for cancer in humans. So in the end, the working group, we had no bioassays because rodents are not likely to go out and fight fires, so you really cannot set up a proper experimental study. Um, so if you gray out the animal evidence, we had sufficient evidence for cancer in humans, and we had mechanistic evidence that was strong, but the driving factor was the fact that the human cancer evidence was sufficient. And so the working group concluded that it was in group one with sufficient evidence for mesothelioma and bladder cancer and the strong mechanistic evidence that I mentioned. In addition to the group one agents, we also have group two agents that are common in the workplace. And many um, exposure circumstances, like manufacturing of different substances, are in group 2A. One example is art glass manufacturing, bitumen emissions during uh, roofing, um, carbon electrode manufacture, which involves a lot of PAH exposure. In fact, a lot of these group 2A agents in the workplace have PAH exposure mixtures. We don't know exactly which PAH is, is responsible, but it's quite clear that these exposures are potentially carcinogenic. An interesting one is exposure as a hairdresser or barber. Many chemicals and night shift work as well are in this category. Well, I want to now touch on some of the challenges of conducting these studies. Um, and one of the challenges is the controversy that they may engender. Firstly, the study findings can influence policy and may have economic and social consequences. So they do tend to generate a lot of interest from the non-scientific community. Um, because of this, access to workplaces to do the studies can be difficult because there may be concerns about what might be found in the studies. The methods are often highly scrutinized and criticized, although they have been robust against these criticisms. And the results are often challenged, leading to reinterpretations and reanalyses of data sets from occupational and environmental cancer. So one example that was um, very familiar to those of you at IARC, I think, is that there was a major US study of diesel fumes and lung cancer. This study took 20 years, about 10 more than it needed to, because of very strong criticism and pressure to, me to uh, really slow down the process of, of getting this review done. All right, so I will come back to the diesel exhaust example when we talk later about some examples of, of risk assessment. But now I'm going to turn to the topic of attributable risk. And people want to know how important is occupational cancer? How much cancer can we attribute to exposure in the workplace? Well, there are, of course, many ways to calculate this. Um, one way to do this is to calculate within the study group the attributable fraction among the exposed, which we call AFE. So AFE is defined as the relative risk or rate ratio minus 1 divided by the rate ratio, which is where RR is the relative risk among those who are exposed compared to those who are unexposed within the cohort. 
One could also calculate within the studied population the population attributable fraction. So the PAF is similar to the calculation of the AFE, however, you need to know the proportion of the people in your study group who had the exposure. So the PAF is a function of the relative risk of those who were exposed compared to those who were unexposed, but it also factors in P, which is the prevalence of the risk factor in the study population. For example, among the cases in a cohort study or among the controls in a case control study. You can also calculate in the overall general population the population attributable fraction. So here the calculation is the same as the one I showed earlier within the cohort or within the study, but instead of the prevalence of the risk factor within the cohort, the PSP, instead we have the prevalence of the risk factor in the general population. And that information can be very difficult to get. So one, one feature of occupational studies that makes them so informative is that generally exposures are higher among workers who are handling an agent. Um, in my own case, looking at beryllium exposed workers, beryllium is a rather unusual exposure in the general population. So by looking at the workplace, you're getting an enrichment of exposure, which allows you to have greater power to detect if there is or is not an association. But if you were to try to calculate the attributable fraction in the general population, that number would require you to know how many people in the general population have beryllium exposure. So PAF calculations tend to be complex and require a lot of assumptions about the latency between exposure and cancer development, and also how you actually define exposure, because Current exposure will have a different risk, risk trajectory than past exposure, and if we have quantitative information, then risk may be uh, proportional to the exposure level. So this is a quite complex calculation generally. And I would argue that use of these techniques like AFE and the PAF are warranted only for causal associations, associations that one is pretty confident are truly causal and not an artifact of, of confounding or bias. So uh, different groups have struggled with how to define an occupational carcinogen. And sometimes they use only agents that are classified in group one. Sometimes they add in agents that have been classified in group 2A. But this really is, is an important decision. OK, now I have a brief question, now that you've heard a tiny little bit about uh, the uh, uh, attributable fraction and the population attributable fraction. For most occupational consider carcinogens, what will generally be higher? Question one is the AFE or the PAF within the studied cohort? So I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if you think it is the AFE in the studied cohort that would be higher than the PAF. I see no hands. Raise your hand if you think the PAF would be higher in the studied cohort. I also, oh, I see one hand. So people maybe are a little confused and don't know which would be the case. Yes? Thank you. Excuse me. I think it's about the prevalence of exposure in the total population of the study and target population and the case. Okay, I didn't quite hear you. You, you. Which of the two do you think would be higher? Uh, I think the AFE would be, would be maybe higher than the PAF because yes. it's the, uh, considered the prevalence in all the population. Exactly right. So I'll, I'll get to it in a second. I'll explain that, but you explained it perfectly. The second question then is what would be higher, the PAF in the studied cohort or in the general population? Raise your hand if you think it is in the studied cohort. Very good, yes. So why is that the case? This is because um, the assigned fraction or the attributable fraction is higher for those who have higher exposure. So exposure in the exposed workers is higher than the average exposure among all workers. And that's higher, generally speaking, than the exposure in the general population. So I'm emphasizing this because this is one reason occupational epidemiology is so very important for cancer epidemiology more generally, but it also means that workers tend to bear a higher burden of cancer than other people do in the population. And I think as public health researchers, it's really important to bear that in mind, that the research that we do is important to understand carcinogenicity, but it's also very important for the health of those workers. <clears throat> 
Okay, so now let's turn to people's calculations of the attributable fraction for the occupational carcinogens. Way back in 1981, Sir Richard Dahl and Richard Pito calculated that 4% of U.S. cancers uh, were caused by occupational exposures. And this had a noted disparity by gender. So this was much, much lower for women than it was for men. 1% for women, 7% per men, for men. And this is generally because of differences in exposure levels between those populations. So men in the workplace, at least at that time, tended to have much higher exposures than women did. So by comparison, they also calculated the attributable fractions for many other causes. And you'll see that occupation was squarely in the middle of, of some. So tobacco rose to the top. Diet at the time, they felt, was 30% of, of the attributable fraction in the population, and on and on and on. Um, then other estimates have been made on a national or international basis. So these generally have, have been in the same ballpark of, say, 4 to 6% overall, with some variation. In 2020, global estimates were produced. And using only the agents that are in group one and that occur in the workplace, Driscoll et al. calculated that occupational exposures accounted for about 4% of worldwide cancer deaths in 2016. So this is roughly 350,000 deaths world, worldwide caused by cancer um, to exposure to our carcinogens. The main occupational carcinogens then were lung, mesothelioma, laryngeal cancer, and leukemia. Um, but they acknowledged that this number would be higher if they had included the agents that are in group 2A. So the, this kind of work is really important and it, it is ongoing. Um, however, it's incomplete because we don't know all of the causes of cancer. So turning now to the environmental carcinogens, there are fewer known environmental carcinogens than occupational. Why is that? Well, the exposures do tend to be lower level in the environment than in the workplace. And from a, an epidemiological perspective, it's more challenging to identify causation when the exposures are low, when the relative risk is low. However, there is potentially a greater population attributable fraction for these environmental exposures because exposure prevalence can be higher for some of them. However, you'll find far fewer uh, calculations of attributable fraction in the general population than you do for workplace exposures. Also, some, if not most, environmental exposures may also be occupational exposures. Some examples include secondhand smoke, which for many workers can be a very high exposure level if you're working inside a smoky bar, for example. Radon for, for underground miners can be quite high. Um, arsenic occurs in drinking water, but it can also occur in smelting operations. PCB exposures may be much higher for electrical workers than for the general population, and so on. So a list of the identified carcinogens in the environment is provided here. Some of the most common are secondhand smoke and lung cancer. I mentioned arsenic in drinking water. Of course, indoor radon is one of the uh, um, estimated leading causes of non-smoking related lung cancer. Arianite, which is a fibrous mineral that's naturally occurring in many parts of the world, is a, a very well-known environmental carcinogen that causes mesothelioma, sometimes at very high rates in local populations. One that we'll revisit shortly is air pollution and lung cancer. And this year marks the 10th anniversary of the IARC monographs meeting that classified air pollution and particulate matter from air pollution as carcinogenic to humans. And the research has only grown and strengthened since that time. And then PCBs causing mel um, melanoma is, is a, the last example. So for the outdoor air pollution monograph, IARC, an IARC working group looked at hundreds of studies. These were all the available studies on air pollution and cancer. And they identified of these hundreds, 14 studies that were considered to be the most informative. These were generally cohort studies, very high quality, from the general populations of North, Europe, Europe, North America, and Asia. So very wide geographic coverage, but you'll note in the global north, not the global south. There were millions of people and, and thousands of cancer cases that were included in, these, in this evaluation. And they had quantitative exposure information, which really did improve the ability to detect an association. Lastly, there was control for important sources of confounding, like cigarette smoking. <laughs> 
So in these 14 studies, there was a small but significant increase in risk, about a 10% higher risk per 10 micrograms per cubic meter of air pollution. So it's important to note that this is a quantitative exposure response analysis. While 10 may seem like a 10% increase may seem low, when you consider that we may have exposures of routinely of 100 micrograms per cubic meter, suddenly the risk becomes quite high if you are in an area of high air pollution. They also looked at the same evidence among never smokers, because this can be an important way of, of evaluating, even though all the studies adjusted for smoking, there was still concern about residual confounding, and they still saw a positive association even among never smokers. So as I mentioned, it can be difficult to estimate the attributable risk or attributable fraction from the environmental exposures. There has been an, a few attempts to do this. The Global Burden of Disease Group calculated for outdoor air pollution and lung cancer, um, estimates ranging from 1 to 25 percent using a theoretical low exposed population and then looking at higher exposure levels. So that can be quite high, um, especially considering that tobacco smoking is such a major cause of lung cancer. Um, also attempts have been made to calculate the attributable fraction from specifically diesel exhaust exposure, which has been classified in group one. And it was calculated that 5 to 6% of the annual lung cancer deaths in the U.S. and U.K. were due to occupational and environmental exposure, compared to if there were no exposure. So of this, 4.5% was thought to be due to environment, with 1.5% due to occupation. Because of the higher prevalence of exposure among the general population and smaller groups of workers that had high exposure levels. So how important, relatively speaking, are environmental versus occupational carcinogens? Well, as I mentioned, there is really no overall estimate of all of the attributable fractions for environmental exposures. Um, we don't have a global burden of environmental cancer like we do for occupational. So we think it's likely that because of the widespread exposure to environmental carcinogens that the, the numbers might be higher than for occupational cancer. However, it's most important to note that for both occupational and environmental cancer, we're completely underestimating these numbers because we don't know all of the causes of cancer and we're not accurately estimating exposures, particularly in places where they might now be higher, like in low and middle income countries. So we, we definitely think this burden is underestimated. Most of what I've talked about so far has been focused on whether these um, environmental and occupational factors can cause cancer. Yet it's also really important to understand how much exposure causes how much cancer. That is to know what is the exposure response relationship. Two reasons this is important are, first of all, for cancer hazard identification and causal inference. You may be familiar with the principles or the viewpoints from Sir Austin Bradford Hill, and one of the most important for inferring causality is that you observe a graded increase in cancer risk or in disease risk with increasing exposure, and this provides strong evidence about causality. But in addition, for risk assessment, it really helps to know quantitatively how much cancer risk comes from how much exposure. And this information is required to set safe workplace and general population exposure limits. So this process, risk assessment, is really, it, it, it's got parts that are scientific and parts that are societal. Um, regulatory agents are charged with seeking an acceptable or safe level of exposure to limit the excess deaths or, current, or serious diseases like cancer. Um, usually, society decides to protect workers um, less than they protect the general population. So for example, a so-called acceptable level of risk might be one per 1,000 excess cancers or one per 10,000 excess cancers in the workplace, whereas for the general population, the acceptable risk might be much lower, like one per 100,000 excess cancers or one per even one million. So these are a societal decision um, these regulatory standards. However, they are informed by science in many cases. So in my own experience, I conducted over a period of about a decade a quantitative exposure response study for beryllium and lung cancer. And this information, which we published, was used a couple years later by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, in the U.S. as part of its justification to reduce exposure limits by tenfold 
And so what we were showing, you can see it probably not well in the graph on the right, was we could model the exposure response curves using all kinds of different modeling assumptions. But regardless, we could see clearly that there was an increase, a sharp increase in risk at fairly low levels of beryllium exposure. And so these calculations told us that regardless of which quantitative model we used, the excess lung cancer risk at this new tenfold lower exposure limit may still exceed the one in 1,000 risk level that was being used at the time. So it's important to understand that workers really need to minimize exposure to the greatest extent possible, and workplaces have a responsibility to, to do this. Um, I mentioned the diesel example. Here, here is a, an example from, uh, that, I, uh, that came out of the monographs meeting. This was a meta-regression that combined exposure response information from three separate studies of diesel exhaust and lung cancer, and literally plotted the data for all three of these studies using the same kind of quantitative uh, mode and the same modeling assumptions. And they were able to calculate the relative risk as a function of elemental carbon, which is an excellent marker of diesel exposure. And through this modeling, they were able to calculate the excess lifetime lung cancer risk at a given level of elemental carbon exposure. And so at these average exposure levels, and they had to also keep in mind what the exposure setting was. So for workers exposed to 25 micrograms per cubic meter of elemental carbon for their entire working life from age 20 to age 65, their excess lifetime risk through age 80 was calculated to be um, between a half a percent and 1%. So 689 cases per 10,000 is, is the chance of, of um, getting cancer from a lifetime of, of occupational exposure at that fairly high level. And so the numbers decline as the exposure levels decrease. And so the general public who would be exposed between ages 5 and 80 to a much lower level of, say, one microgram per cubic meter would have only a 26 in 10,000 uh, chance or excess lifetime risk of cancer through age 80. So um, just a few photos of workers in exposed scenarios, and you can see all over the world that particulate exposures, PAH exposures, and even sometimes the things we can't see. The, the picture on the right shows line workers and electric power lines. And so electric, um, um, low frequency magnetic field radiation is an important um, ongoing emerging uh, uh, agent that's under study and has been for years. I'm going to close sh here shortly by talking about the emerging occupational and environmental carcinogens. And these photos are from my own research that I conducted um, in the few years before I left NIOSH. I was doing field studies of workers handling carbon nanotubes. These are sort of, the, the fear is these may be the next asbestos because they're fibrous and persistent fibers. And in fact, in our studies, the, the micrograph that you see on the lower left shows a sputum sample from one of the workers, and you can clearly see that there's a, a carbon nanotube that's in, in the sputum. So we have evidence of exposure, and we're looking at some of the mechanistic endpoints that I mentioned earlier. This very colorful graph is the set of current priorities that the monographs, working, that the monographs team is, is working our way through during the current five-year period. Every five years, we have an advisory group who give us a list of things that should be evaluated in the monographs. And I'm going to do a zoom in on these different quadrants. But before I do that, I'll orient you to how to view these. The color indicates which evidence stream contributes to the nomination. So red indicates mechanistic evidence, blue indicates human cancer evidence, and yellow indicates cancer bioassays. And then their combinations of those colors, the secondary colors, indicate combinations of evidence. Green for bioassay and human cancer, orange for mechanistic and bioassay, purple for mechanistic and human cancer, and then multicolored if all three streams contributed to the nomination. And then agents that are in the inner circle were the high priority agents. So if we look at this quadrant by quadrant, we can see that for the dyes, solvents, and other chemicals, you see a lot of orange, red, and yellow. And this means that there is bioassay and mechanistic evidence that is contributing to the evidence stream for consideration. We've completed many of these evaluations based on the assessment of the, there, there really were no human cancer studies to speak of, um, but we had some with mechanistic evidence in people. The upper right quadrant of that figure shows the flame retardants and the pesticide group 
The pesticide group is quite colorful, and this is because there's often contributing evidence from all three streams, human cancer, bioassay, and mechanistic evidence. And the mechanistic evidence can be even in people applying pesticides, for example. Um, on the left side, we see the flame retardants and persistent organic pollutants. And one of these, this group called some perfluorinated compounds, will be the subject of a monographs meeting in the fall on PFOA and PFOS. The metals, particles, and fibers tend to have quite a lot of human cancer evidence combined with mechanistic evidence. And so we see metals, fibers. We've done several of these already. And next year, in June, we'll be evaluating talc as well as acrylonitrile. The complex occupational environmental exposures are shown in the lower left quadrant, and this includes occupational exposure as a firefighter. So a lot of human studies in mechanisms and cancer. Um, so what have we learned about breast cancer in particular? I want to just focus on this a little bit. So as you've seen this figure already once, as we mentioned, we know very little about the preventable causes of human, cancer, human breast cancer. So as you've, I've shown you and hopefully convinced you, occupational studies are key to understanding the causes of cancer. So fully half of the known um, human carcinogens were identified by studies in workers. However, this is not true for breast cancer. So here in this little picture on the lower left, I have the list, the complete list of the known human breast carcinogens. It's a very small list, only, eight, only six agents, and none of these were identified in the workplace. However, the agents that have limited evidence for breast cancer, four of them were identified by studies in the workplace. However, because there are relatively few women with high exposures in the workplace, it's really hard to do cancer epidemiology studies in these workplaces, so the evidence was called limited. In addition, the animal cancer bioassays don't really map that closely onto the human breast carcinogens. So this is the list of agents that have sufficient evidence for mammary tumors in animals. And this list really doesn't overlap much at all with the known human breast carcinogens. There's only one agent that's common to both, and also only one agent that's common to the limited list. So animal studies are really not getting us there. However, we do think that conducting studies of the key characteristics, particularly in women who are exposed in the workplace, could be a really important method for identifying breast carcinogens. This is because the key characteristics of carcinogens map very well to the known mechanisms of breast carcinogenicity. Occupational studies, as I said, may be critical to identifying breast carcinogens. And we think that conducting mechanistic studies in occupationally exposed women could accelerate the identification of breast carcinogens for both agents currently in group two and for new agents, including some pesticides, solvents, and, and including metalworking fluids. I will, I'm almost done and we'll open it up for questions, but I'm using this same approach to look at briefly at the breadth of the recent carcinogenicity evaluations of environmentally relevant agents. So this is a similar presentation and this um, slide is online. I can send this link to you if you'd like to look at it more closely. But in just the past 10 years, the Monographs program has evaluated 133 environmentally relevant agents. They've been evaluated or reevaluated. And the schema shown here is group one in the middle, moving out to group three at the periphery. And what I want you to take away from this is that um, nearly all of the agents that are in the middle with group one have contributions of evidence coming from all three streams. It's not required that they show evidence of cancer in animals or mechanistic evidence. However, they generally do. It's very unusual for human cancer to be the only stream that contributes to an evaluation. Two examples of this are two agents on our high priority list, including PFOA and PFOS, which we're evaluating this fall, and then radiofrequency electromagnetic field radiation, which is another area of quite active interest. So I'll close by repeating some of the key messages. Hopefully you've been able to take away with you. Occupational and environmental epidemiology have been and will remain critically important to understanding the causes of cancer. The occupational and environmental cancer burden is, is high and they're underestimated because we simply don't know all of the causes of cancer, nor do we know who's exposed, particularly in low and middle income countries. Studies in exposed humans may be used in risk assessment to help set exposure levels to reduce cancer risks 
in both workers and in the general population. And I thank you so much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take some questions now. Does anyone have any? Yes. Uh, thank you for that. I'm a little bit far from this field, but I'm really concerned regarding the mechanistic evidence. Like, it's really hard to replicate or to confirm mechanistic evidence in a basic, uh, basic setting. So what are the best ways to confirm this? Yes, that's an excellent point. So as I mentioned, it's not enough in the human cancer evidence stream and certainly not in the mechanistic evidence stream to rely on a single study. So we have uh, in the monographs a preamble that guides the review process for each stream and one of the considerations is that there needs to be a consistent and coherent body of evidence for supporting these mechanistic ter determinations. Um, but I'll give you some examples of, of how we can do this. So in the past, many substances have been known, found to be genotoxic. And we know that genotoxicity is a very important mechanism of carcinogenesis. However, it's rather unusual to find agents that are strongly genotoxic. So conducting well-designed studies in people who are using genotoxic agents has been critical to pointing to genotoxicity as, as the mechanistic, at least a mechanistic endpoint. And the group one agents have consistently shown that when there's evidence of genotoxicity, later we find that there is increases in human cancer after that. So there needs to be consideration of the study quality, the study consistency, and how well the endpoints were measured how well confounders were dealt with and selection bias addressed, for example. I'd be happy to talk with you more about that yeah. offline. Actually, we conducted a study on heavy metals and war zones and my antimicrobial resistance. It wasn't like cancer, but the outcome was antimicrobial resistance. And we had strong evidence from human samples that there is in the blood heavy metals and they have antimicrobial resistance. However, we tried to replicate this in bacterial cultures. And this what is isn't, I know that we have tried to, uh, to do the dosing, to, to, to address the protocol, but we are never able to replicate and prove it in a basic yeah. science setting. You know what I mean? So this is yeah. challenging, even I think in cancer. Yeah, the basic science side of it I haven't really addressed, but the, the mechanistic stream includes what we call in vitro studies, which would be studies in, uh, of cells on culture or yeah, purely, purely um, experimental studies. There could also be experimental in vivo studies where you look at genotoxicity in animals that have been given the ex exposure. And those also are evaluated very carefully to see if the evidence is consistent and coherent. When you're dealing with studies in exposed humans, you're not intentionally exposing them, but it's, it's an epidemiology study where you're looking at evidence from people who have been exposed through their work or through the environment. So these are not, they're not ethical to conduct in an experimental setting. So you really have to bring to this all of the things that you're learning about how to design well-conducted studies, but you have additional concerns about how relevant the endpoint is for carcinogenicity. And this is where the use of the key characteristics I think is actually helpful because through the use of uh, the evaluation of the evidence emerging from the known human carcinogens, assays that have been shown to be sensitive and reliable for measuring those endpoints have also emerged and there are papers written about them. One can pick those up and design studies to evaluate you know, is there actually strong evidence for this in exposed humans? And often, you know, the studies are not simply strong enough to do it. You mentioned metals, I think, and, and that was a recent meeting that we had in the monographs, um, which had some studies of mechanistic endpoints in workers exposed to cobalt and antimony. And um, there was some evidence of genotoxicity, but it was not what was considered consistent enough or of high enough quality to actually call it strong. So it's a rather high bar to conclude, but you know, the studies won't get done. What's more concerning to me is that we have not great studies and very few of them. And so it's also hard to sort of rule out these mechanisms. So it would be ideal if we, we were thinking more about this as we're designing our, our biomarker studies. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, my question is about the K character, uh, characteristics. Uh, I think there is a overlap between the um, among these ten uh, K characteristics. For example, between uh, uh, number two and three, or five and six. For example, when we when uh, the oxidative stress and chronic inflammation somehow sometimes be together or the genotoxic and alteration of DNA repair? Yes, very good point. So here's the list of the 10 key characteristics. And they don't, you're right, they don't tend to operate in isolation. So, and I like to think of them as almost structured along the pathway between exposure and cancer. So if you look at the KC10, um, this is sort of, pretty far along the pathway. It includes things like angiogenesis. So the tumor has already formed and now it's perhaps metastasizing. Whereas KC1 is really the first step between exposure and perhaps genotoxicity. So they are intertwined. They're not mutually exclusive. And we do often see them co-occurring together, like genotoxicity and inducing epigenetic alterations. Um, induction of, of oxidative stress together with chronic inflammation, those can go together. So they're not, they're not meant to be um, unique and, you know, there must be only one and only one KC seen for any particular agent. In fact, often it's common that there will be, it's very uncommon to see lots of consistent and coherent evidence in exposed humans like we did for firefighters, but in experimental systems it's often common to see electrophilicity combining with genotoxicity. We have rarely seen strong evidence for, or consistent and coherent evidence for induces epigenetic alterations, KC4, and I think that's going to be really an emerging area as omics research has, begins to bear more fruit in terms of causation. One thing I did not mention is that IARC, the monographs program is having a workshop in a month and a half um, about the KCs, including evidence of the KCs in exposed humans. And so the idea is to reflect upon what's been learned in the monographs and other programs that use the KCs and to sort of further develop guidance for working groups who are considering aspects of study design, endpoint measurement, and how the KCs relate to each other. Yes, other questions? Sir. Okay, thank you. Um, in the mechanistic study, what uh, factor of um, the animal model could be considered or the human could be considered? Like, for instance, uh, the microbiome can uh, are effect modifier, even the genetic that could be actually detoxify or change um, um, carcinogenic. Yeah, boy, what a great question. And <clears throat> I think this is going, the microbiome effects are going to be um, more and more considered in future. If, if you look closely at our list of priorities, you'll see that dysbiotic microbiota, it's kind of a strange way of calling microbiome disruption, but that's how it's listed in the meeting. That was actually given high priority. And as we were looking across the landscape of research on this topic, um, we didn't feel that it was quite ready to do a monograph on it yet, but I think that is an extremely important topic, and it can lead to evidence of the KCs um, as well. So I, I would encourage people who are interested in this to, to reach out to the groups that are actively working on this to identify how the microbiome is disrupted from exposure to various environmental and occupational and dietary factors, and then how that affects later development of the KCs, and then possibly cancer. But the, the nice thing about the KCs is that you don't need to have a predicted pathway of going, well, I know that A happens, exposure, and then B, C, D, E, F, G. It actually allows you to have a sort of hypothesis-free evaluation of the evidence as it stands. Is there evidence that it behaves like a carcinogen? The more evidence you have, like having five KCs here, lent, really lent support to the working group's conclusions that exposure as a firefighter was carcinogenic because we're seeing these, these um, characteristics of known carcinogens appearing in firefighters with consistency. So microbiome disruption, um, any novel sort of mechanistic, another good example of a similar thing would be lipid dysregulation. That's not a KC right now, but of course that's thought to be an important um, pathway to obesity-derived cancer. 
And so how all of this new emerging evidence on mechanisms of carcinogenesis would get brought into consideration by the monographs is a topic for a lot of discussion. And I, I think our stance now is that we, we look to the evidence to guide us. So when we see carcinogens that have known carcinogens, which come from the human cancer evidence, from well-conducted epidemiology studies, if we see known carcinogens behaving in new ways that we don't have already covered by the KCs, perhaps someday microbiome disruption, then that might lead to a new, K, a new KC being developed. But it requires first that that evidence linkage be there from the human cancer studies. You guys are asking great questions. Uh, I think you, were, you had your hand up first. I can't see your name. Yes. Thank you for a great lecture. I have questions about the, uh, I think that every day the new chemicals are developed and applied to the industry. Like in South Korea, we have some problem related to new chemical, like the humiliator disinfection products occur the pulmonary fibrosis and like semiconduct industry, they cause the leukemia. So I think after develop the cancer is quite laid approach, I think so. So if it's a possible to like more prospective approach that if the new chemicals are developed and before applied to the industry or our like uh, routine lifestyle, then be before it loaded in the uh, in our life is is there any way to prevent or detect, like we already know the 10 characteristics related to carcinogens, so I'm curious about is there any method or is or just going on or yeah. is possible? Yeah, that's a, another excellent question. And I think that was really the impetus to develop the key characteristics um, and to incorporate them into the evidence evaluation. So one thing I did not really go into much was how the, how the streams are integrated together. But in fact, it's possible to have an agent go into group 2B, possibly carcinogenic to humans, purely on the basis of the mechanistic evidence and strong evidence of the KCs. So it's a high bar, but we actually have some recent examples where uh, the chemical acrolin, which is, um, it's a byproduct, it's an industrial chemical, but it's also a byproduct of combustion and cooking oil burning. So a lot of workers are getting exposed to this and through high temperature oil heating. It's very noxious, it's, it's, it's a, an, an aldehyde that's quite, quite a, a noxious. And, and that was evaluated, it had animal bioassay evidence, but the, the mechanistic evidence was very strong. And there's sort of a sister aldehyde called, called crotonaldehyde that didn't yet have a bioassay. And so that was classified in group 2B simply on the basis of its strong exhibiting of the key characteristics of carcinogens. So incorporating this evidence from mechanisms into cancer hazard identification is one way to get an early view of what the properties might be. And you mentioned pulmonary fibrosis. You know, I think um, fibrotic lung disease and cancer have a very interesting relationship. They, many things that cause fibrotic lung disease also cause cancer. Um, beryllium is an example. Um, silica is an example. And there are many others. Many of the metals and particles and fibers have this property. So that's another dilemma is how, to, how d does fibrotic lung disease fit into the KCs, and, and I think it happens through some of the mechanisms of fibrosis, like oxidative stress, induction, chronic inflammation, which are, is persistent. Um, and so surely these studies are being reviewed in, in the monographs meetings. The metals meeting that I mentioned, there were some studies of, of fibrotic lung disease um, that were contributing, even though there were not enough to say that the evidence was strong, it was still suggestive, and that was noted. Maybe one last very quick question with a quick answer. <laughs> I think your hand was up first. Yeah. Um, thank you for your lecture, Dr. Schubauer. I wanted to ask if you could please uh, give us more insight into how the prioritization, how um, possible carcinogens are prioritized for for newer editions of the monograph, please. Yeah, the great question. We, I'm glad you asked this because there's an opportunity open now for all of you to nominate agents for the next prioritization meeting. 
Um, I don't have the slide, but I will get Laura to send you the link. And you can nominate agents for consideration by an advisory group that we're, we'll be convening next March. So this will have about 30 participants from all over the world who will be sifting through all of the nominated agents from the scientific community, the general public, and all the things left over on our list that we couldn't get to. So they'll be giving us a list of priorities. Um, and, it, and the prioritization is new agents that have never been evaluated before, but that show some evidence of carcinogenicity. We do not randomly look at, say, every new chemical that comes in. There has to be some evidence that suggests it might get into one of these groups, right? Because it's too time consuming and costly to just randomly evaluate chemicals in the monographs. So they'll look at this list very carefully and determine whether there is perhaps at least limited, if not sufficient evidence for one or more cancer sites in humans, or whether there is an animal bioassay that might lead to sufficient evidence in animals, or whether there's mechanistic evidence related to the KCs. And then they prioritize the list into sort of three tiers, uh, high priority and ready to go now, high priority but wait a little bit, then medium priority, low priority, and no priority. And then we look at that list and look at what sort of skill sets we need, figure out how to combine agents, try to understand if there's emerging evidence that we should sort of hold off and wait for, and that's a more in-depth process that happens at the level of the secretariat at IARC. But great question, and the closing date for the new nominations is November 30th, so I encourage people, that would have been a great project for your students, to think about agents that should be nominated for the monographs. So. Great idea, thank you. Thank you so much.